Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Cloud Masters. I'm your host, Matan Bordeaux, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sam Clark. We have three TAMs or technical account managers from Doit joining us to share some interesting cost-saving stories um, with the goal of giving you some key lessons learned and takeaways that you can implement in your own situation if you're if you're finding yourself in a situation in a similar situation to these customers. Um, and so just for those who aren't familiar, Sam or any any of the TAMs here, because Sam is also a TAM. Um, yeah, we're with my people today. Maybe this is great. very quickly describe what do TAMs do it, do it. Maybe those who are familiar with AWS TAMs, they, uh, whoever's listening will be familiar, but maybe just a level set, uh, why we have TAMs on here in the first place. And then we'll jump into the stories. So, um, do it TAMs as a former AWS TAM, um, I think I can speak almost eloquently to this. Um, do it TAMs are actually a lot like AWS TAMs. We provide white glove support for our customers, ensuring that their support cases get routed. We help them, um, launch new services. We help them with big, large scale events or LSEs. Um, and really we're just there as a technical touch point for all things related to their account, including the, including, um, spend analysis, uh, finding savings, uh, and just teaching folks how to use the cloud in a more economical manner, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely that. And it, it's funny that you say XAWS because all four of us, uh, all, all the times on the call are ex Amazon, uh, from one place or another. Uh, myself in Germany and Yeva and Ian both in the UK. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as Matan mentioned, we want to talk about some, some interesting ways that we've helped customers, uh, save some money. Um, who should, Yeva, do you want to go first and give us, uh, uh, maybe something interesting to get us started? Uh, sure. I can, I can start. Like all of the customer stories are interesting, right? But it's, it's, it's not necessarily that they're always, you know, so, so impactful to, you know, be uh the the name of a blog or or a podcast but i'd say that's what keeps our job really interesting right that we've got so many different challenges and different ways that we help our customers as eric mentioned and the story that i bring today is related to eks um and i have a customer who are deployed on aws and uh historically say may, they made some architectural decisions that uh that are they were a little bit outdated today and uh they basically uh ended up costing a lot so the decision was made to architect their eks across five availability zones and funnily enough the reason for that was cost savings they wanted to take advantage of as many spot instances as uh as they could and and they used to be uh bigger limits than there are right now for deploying uh, spot instances in terms of, you know, limits per availability zone. Um, and obviously with EKS, you can do that. And it's, uh, and it's you know, a uh, recommended practice for, uh, for high availability, you know, to, to get that deployed across multiple AZs. And they did five availability zones in a region. And they, of course, saved a lot of on compute. Um, but their inter AV data charges were through the roof and uh, they came to us for help. So once we started working with them, we noticed, uh, so there is a thing called topology aware routing hints and that just was not enabled. Um, and what it means is basically you can make use of uh, that topology aware routing, which are additional, so hints are additional labels that you can um, add on the controller uh, that contain the availability zone information. And then what it means is that the endpoints are filtered based on those hints. And in most cases, um, same zone endpoints are cho chosen. But obviously, you know, if, if one availability zone is down, then the traffic would be routed to a different AC. So it's not a restrictive measure. And Following that suggestion, uh, so in this particular case, it was super impactful. They were spending around $800,000 per month and about $200,000 each month uh, were saved just by switching on that one feature that they did not know about. Um, and my takeaway would be from that, that just keep reviewing your architecture, especially if the decisions were made based on, on some historical limitations. Nice one. So, I mean, um, I guess for, for those that aren't aware on the EKS side, um, we're talking about they're taking the, 
So if you've got a, a container running in, um, I'm, I'm guessing this was US East 1 because it's the only place with five AZs that I can think of. Um, but if you've got a container running in, in availability zone A and it's looking for an endpoint, it will first then try to find another one in its own AZ in, in A before it looks to the rest of the, the cluster or, or uh, the service mesh. Um, a really nice one. The, um, I guess the, the, the key that, that makes me think of straight away is that FinOps story, right? Where um, we do a cost optimization and that's for today. And that's a great decision today because that's where the technology is. That's where our user load is and everything else. But the cloud changes so far. You got to keep up with what the new features are and the, the topology we're routing uh, is one that I think was only released last year, right? Yes, yeah. Th there is an excellent blog actually uh, from AWS on this particular feature, and it has a really nice graph that I love, which showing how the traffic would just you know bounce completely uh, irrationally between the zones, and then once you know switch uh, topology of routing, then it just seems so much tidier. Yeah, nice. We'll we'll pop a link to that uh, blog article in the resources for the post, Matan. Yes, yeah, send that to me. Um, is there like a is there a rule of thumb about how often you should check your architecture decisions, or is it more milestone based? Uh, the favorite answer for everyone it depends, right? <laughs> um, it it really depends on the business requirement, right? And uh, if you're in a period of growth, or in, if you're in a period of optimizing. But if you reach the level of optimizing, I would say yeah, just review the, those like big decisions that you've made historically, or you know if your I don't know, you've got a brand new team or you've got, uh, yeah, other people with different experience that potentially can bring some, you know, additional insights from, you know, various different job roles or different companies. You know, if, if the answer is we've always done it this way, then go and review it. That's probably wrong. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe more specifically for this company, when would have been the best time for them for them, was it just, oh, this feature, this new feature is released, we should consider it? Or was it, was, is it? They were not aware that this feature was out there. Um, mm. And they were so busy focusing with keeping the lights on. Um, and uh, just because their business was good, you know, it's, it's going well, they're, they're making a lot of money. Uh, but the fact that, you know, this note notice a big chunk of one service, well, aka the, the data transfer costs just ballooning. That was the red flag for them. I think you mentioned exactly the word red flag, Yeva. That was one of the topics that we did previously on the podcast, uh, Matan, uh, and we have actually a, a blog post about it as well. And, and it's it's that situation where you see a, a, a usage creeping up, anything, doesn't matter what it is. If it's creeping up and over time becoming one of your most, most uh, one of the biggest parts of your bill, then you probably need to check it, right? And see if there's a better way to do it. And it might be a, a full re-architecture. It might be something as awesome as, there's a new feature that you can just turn on, um, but it might might be something a bit more uh, proactive, a bit harder work to get it under control. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Yeva. Um, Ian, you mentioned something to me about uh, you had a customer, I think, who was overcommitted in their EDP and found some fancy ways to kind of uh, remedy that situation. Do I have that right? Yeah. So that, although this is a, a podcast for you know, re re reducing your customer's run rate and saving them money. Um, they had this lovely situation where they, they weren't spending enough and they were going to fall short of their uh, three-year EDP, their, their PPA commit with um, AWS. And obviously what I wanted to do uh, was not just encourage them to go and, you know, spend a load of money on a load of new services. Um, so I, they, they had a fair amount of, of uh, compute uh, that wasn't really optimized. So it was just uh, uh, going through um, FlexSafe. Um, and if I've got a customer like that, I would normally um, advocate a policy-based approach, you know, something where you can get the maximum amount of discount um, and something where you would purchase uh, incrementally. So over a period of time, obviously the higher the discount, the lower the risk. Um, and if you can stagger your purchases, you know, by the time you get up to the level you want to be, the first one's kind of maturing or timing out. So you've got the option then to reduce or increase or maintain. Um, and so I, you know, made this uh, suggestion to them. I've done the, you know, the documentations and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it became clear that they were they were running very short. So effectively, what we 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 did was was to kind of uh, educate them on the break even point and when they should be buying purchases. So the break even point is effectively if you look at how much it would cost uh, over the whole period of your subscription. Um, 
what's at what point would you use all that money on, a, on an on-demand burn down? So let's say uh, like a three-year, what I normally recommend because it's flexible, but the three-year all upfront compute gives you maximum saving with maximum flexibility. It's a kind of sweet spot. It'll get you a various, there are various, depending on the region, depending on the instance, it'll, it'll get you different discounts, but you know, approximately 50%. So because you're running at, at half as half as on demand, your, your, your break even point for your three years would come about halfway through. So about 18 months. Um, so the concept really is if you, if you buy a three year all up front and the pit, the time to the break even point is less than the time to the end of the PPA or the end of the EDP, you'll take money out. You'll reduce your PPA. So what you're looking at is all these different sliders, but you're choosing wherever your EDP is, you're kind of putting an artificial start and an end. If your time to break even point is greater than the time left on the PPA, all right, then you'll contribute. And the closer your purchase period is to the termination of your PPA, right? You see some kind of spinning eyes here. This is my customer's eyes are pretty spinning at this point. Then the more money you're going to contribute to that PPA period. So what we did was I kind of said, right, the other thing, there are all sorts of complications. The other thing to consider is obviously what savings plans do is they look for the biggest discount first. So when you first buy a three year all up front, it's going to take the biggest discount. So just to be pessimistic, you always try and be pessimistic with these things. I said, okay, like for the first one, let's not say an 18 month break even point, let's say a 14 month. So rule number one, right? Don't buy anything unless there's a year left, right? Don't buy it earlier than a year left and, and nibble. And again, if you're, uh, I talk about policy base. So I talk about buying a percentage of what's available. So they were, I think they were like 40 or $50 an hour comfortably. Anything else above that was, was spiky. So if you say, okay, cover 10% every quarter in the first year and the second year cover 15% and the third year cover 20%. The thing is that's after the discounts, because a three year all up front gets you 50% off. If you want to cover 10%, you need to buy $5 or sorry, if you want to cover $10, you need to buy $5 because that $5 will burn at half price. So it's not a case of saying, okay, I'm going to buy you know, 10% of $50. I'm going to buy five. You have to work out based on what you're buying, what your burn down rate is and how much that is. Okay. Um, I'm nice spinning time over. Um, so effectively what we said was nibble away. So with a year left, uh, buy $2 right. and then with nine months left buy $2. And then we kind of tweaked it a little bit because normally I would say, you know, do a 10%, do a 10% of what's left, 10% of what's left. So here we, we cheated a little bit and we started to go up a bit. So with three months left, we said, okay, buy like 15% and just before, just before the commit finishes and buy another kind of 15%. It takes you up to about sort of, I don't know, 46, 40, 40, 50%, depending on, on how they, their uh, other dynamic workloads are, are affecting their compute. But ultimately it's sort of front loading, um, their PPA. Uh, and they were about, I mean, they were significantly in arrears. They were like, uh, I think getting onto a million. Um, so this wasn't affecting, this wasn't fixing everything. Um, but it was taking, uh, you know, addressing something like a quarter of that. So it was a significant contribution to their PPA deficit. Uh, and it's ongoing right now. This is what we're, what we're doing with the customer right now. And they were using FlexSafe as well. So they're using FlexSafe and, and I use FlexSafe. It's a great indicator because we're, what FlexSafe covers is a fairly, not, fairly comfortable kind of uh, level to aim for. So basically my, my, these things are complex, right? So you keep them as simple as you can. Um, so my usual, my usual speed is what's, what's flex safe covering. Okay. That's your target. Take 10% of that, take 15% of that it makes life much easier. And obviously if their usage goes up, then the 10% is higher. If their usage comes down, it's lower. And so it kind of flexes to, to how their usage is changing over time. By the way, for those who aren't aware what flex save is, um, we basically automating the application of savings plans onto your on-demand workloads, and we're giving you the one year savings plan savings rate on those workloads. Um, and so sometimes customers like to layer three year saving plans on top of that. Um, they'll do three year savings plans on what they feel really sure about for the next three years, or at least 
the break even point, 14 months, 18 months, whatever. And then they'll let FlexSafe cover the rest. They don't have to really manage or monitor their savings plan. Just one of the things I really like about what Ian was saying, um, and, and it brings me back to reInvent sessions with uh, one of our old friends, Nathan Besh, um, who used to be the head of the well-architected cost optimization pillar. Um, but you really have to take the emotion out of savings plans and commitments and look at it mathematically and analytically because it can be a little bit hard to tell someone in finance, hey, we're going to pay for this thing for three years, even though we're only going to use it for two years. And for that last year, we're going to keep paying monthly as if we were still using it. But the break-even point, as Ian already mentioned, in some cases even earlier than that, but say it's about halfway. If you discount 50%, the break-even point's halfway. And after that, it's all free. So at the end of three years, you are still ahead. It's just really hard to explain that to people sometimes. And getting analytic and taking the, the mathematical approach um, goes some way to helping you explain that. It doesn't always work. But taking the emotion out is a very good way of putting it. It's about risk and it's about rate. The higher the discount, the lower the risk because the break-even point comes quicker. So you're, yep. you know, you're running free faster. So it's worth investing money to reduce the risk of losing money. Exactly. I think in all situations like where you have to pay up front for something like that, but you get a discount in the end, it can be tough. Yeah, but the end, the end of the commit dis, uh, situation is, is the opposite, right? You're going to have to give that money to AWS anyway right. if you haven't reached it. So if you're going to be writing them a check one way or the other, you might as well do it with something you can use, whether it's RDS reserved instances, um, what, whatever thing you can pay up front. And, and that's one, one advantage that you have in AWS against uh, Google cards. You can't pay them up front, which is a little bit annoying um, because that'd Ooh. be a nice way to burn it off. Can you do it with flex cards? Feature request. For anyone, anyone listening, but um, yeah, I think that's that's a nice way to do because like typically I'm not a TAM, I'm not helping, I'm not working with customers in that regard. Like my, my first instinct is like marketplace purchases is another one. Yeah, yeah, I, ne I nearly said that because um, I see sometimes customers just going to shop to the marketplace just because they need to bridge uh, bridge the end of the commit and they buy software. That, you know, in, in a year or two years, everyone is questioning. It's like, so why did we get it? And no one knows, but it was to bridge the commit. So might as well get, you know, savings plans or, or reserved instances. Still better than Bitcoin mining, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's on the line why you should never use marketplace purchases as, as a comfortable, under, you know, a comfortable part of burning down a commit. Uh, this customer did, uh, and things went very wrong with this particular marketplace offering, and they cancelled it. And they went, had all sorts of trouble. We had all sorts of grief with AWS and, there's a big story there, but it left a huge hole in their commit and, and uh, nobody was budgeting. You, budgeting. You, you alluded to misunderstandings kind of with, with the custom that they had within themselves as they're prepping. I don't know. I don't know if the misunderstandings were in making the commitment itself or figuring out how to draw it down. Um, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, they, they, uh, the commit was very, uh, the commit was very, I guess, optimistic, um, and uh, it came, it came rather unfortunately just before a, a period of very effective cost optimization and, and redesign, uh, which I, I think was more effective than they realized. Uh, and and they um, they cut their they cut their run, their, their overhead significantly, and then they they lost this this particular marketplace, um, the marketplace kind of addition. Um, and when I first, to be fair, when I first presented these uh, the, these kind of you know. Um, functions of savings plans uh i got blank looks all around and it, it took a while really for them to kind of appreciate what what we were trying to do and it is that i think this is the key is to try and keep it simple the key is to underestimate be pessimistic and keep it simple and i use i i'm not use a phrase like I, i've said this to a few people you know would you spend if you're going to buy a car you know would you spend twice as much on it just so that you can give it back next month rather than keep it for three years. I know I'm going to pay mine half price, like 50% off just so I can drive it for three years while I only have to drive it for 18 months and it's, and it's, and it's cheaper. So I think those are the kind of, you know, when you talk to, um, it is finance teams where you get a lot of problems with or a lot of challenges with, and those who have, um, you know, commitment phobia, uh, that, you know, automatically rule it out. Uh, and then you've got to start talking about risk and you just, you know, and talking about rate and talking about, you know, how much, uh, really they're giving away, they're paying just for the benefit of being, you know, free and easy or perception in, in their perception. It's a nice, uh, 
it's a nice story. Um, once again, I went, I went, I marketplace was my first, was my first go-to in my head. Eric, I'm interested in your story. That was actually really interesting though. Thank you so much for sharing Ian. Um, mine's a little bit different. Uh, mine actually kind of harkens back to, uh, we built it one way, um, for no reason. Um, but somebody is now giving us a better idea. Um, I have a customer that works in life care, life care and health or life sciences, healthcare, um, specifically around optometry. And one of the things they did was when they developed their system, this is on Google cloud, by the way, uh, since we need to differentiate, uh, multi-cloud masters here. Um, so what they did was they built a uh, imaging solution and they used uh, persistent disc to do it, um, because they wanted the speed, they wanted the growing capacity, they wanted the backup capability and all of these other things. And all it was doing was storing the images to whenever you go to your optometrist office and the doctor says, well, Hey, well, let's take a look at your images from last year. And they click on a button and you wait about three seconds. Um, they wanted to cut that three seconds down to one second. So I'm, there's a couple of tiers to this that I wanted, I wanted to actually address. The first is, um, I don't think that when it was designed, they were meeting their customer where their customer is. They were actually just doing something because this is the fastest way to do it. This is the, this is the quote unquote bog standard way to do it. And they never thought outside the box of do my customers, when they're sitting in that optometry chair, when they're sitting there with the doctor, does the difference between two seconds of image retrieval and five seconds or 10 seconds of image retrieval really matter? Now think back to the last time you were in your optometrist office and they were pulling up your imagery. I doubt anybody can say, I was so upset because I had to wait 11 seconds before the doctor could say, nope, looks just like that. We have here, we have a condition where, uh, the cut, when the customer would go to the optometry office, they would get their imagery taken. That imagery would be then uploaded to the cloud to a persistent disc that was being backed up in, um, Google compute engine. And then it would be maybe read again, never. Because these are optometry office specific customers. If you switch optometry offices and go to another one, like I moved, I don't go to the same one I used to go to that image is never going to get pulled again. So what we have is a lot of junk images, a lot of old images, not junk, but a lot of older images that need to be kept for um, compliance reasons that are never being read again. Um, I'm talking petabytes of persistent disk, um, huge amounts of money being spent. And all we did was go in and ask the question of, hey, do you need this this fast? Why did you do this this way? And it turns out, no, they didn't. And when we sat down and talked about it, they went back, we sat down and we talked about it. We discussed some of the outcomes and the options and the pluses and minuses, because there is some minuses. You're going to have to rework an entire stack. Images will be slower to retrieve. You're going to pay a ton up front for the put costs for all these images because of the operations and everything else. So we, just like Ian was talking about, we had to build out that timeline for the customer and say, hey, listen, yes, your next three months bill after you implement this will be larger as you shuffle all these images over and you have to keep the persistent disk because the images aren't there yet. All the things that we know about as technical folks that happen when you do one of these big changes. At three months down the line, their bill is their bill for storage of their primary asset is up by 40%. So now we can actually just schedule that out. And over the next year, it's going to pay for itself. Um, so the whole point of all of that is simply it is, we often don't ask why, because why can be a triggering question for engineers, especially because they built it a certain way. And if you ask why you are, um, and we're not trying to do that. What we're trying to do is, are you working smarter or are you working harder? So, um, we had to have a very careful conversation with them, but it was, it was rewarding in the end because we were able to help. Um, and overall that, that's kind of what those kind of my takeaways. It is always okay to ask why somebody is doing something a certain way, especially if you can see a way that they could save some money on it. Now that path wasn't easy. Um, it did cost money to do because they had to rework a software stack a little bit to do different API calls and they had to train their engineers a little bit differently. But in the end, it was well worth it. And there's been no complaints moving forward. They moved all those petabytes over to cloud storage. Um, they are more secure, more durable and cheaper overall. Plus they have the ability to move them. Um, they have turned on Google's, uh, auto to class storage. And so this image is just dropping down to archive. They're never being read again. Google's just moving them down for them. Um, that uh in itself kind of probably paid for a lot of this i was just gonna say i love the point you make about asking why um mm -hmm. because it is it is a very challenging thing it's quite affronting to um to the engineers that um may feel accused mm -hmm. you know, may feel that you're saying which, which person designed this rubbish you know this kind of exactly. thing. exactly but it's not it's not ever meant that way obviously it's it's always uh we're trying to be constructive and we're trying to help people 
Um, and it's it's not a case of why did you build it this way? It's why is it built this way, right? And absolutely. And were we really thinking? Uh, I'm thinking of that meme. You know, uh, they 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 realized they could build it with technology, but no one ever asked if they should build it, right? It, this, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. the question. That is the you can, but do you need to? Yeah. I it's funny because I've never had an optometrist show me my previous imagery, so I'm, I'm interested in this story. And yeah. Uh, and I don't know if they show it to everyone. I'm always curious because I like looking at pictures. I, I'm like, oh, that's cool looking. But yeah, so it was, uh, it's just one of those things that as a consumer of the technology down at the, the very lowest level, I, can, I, I see why they made the choice, but it doesn't make any difference to me as a customer. So I'd rather have them be able to redirect that money towards like uh, R&D or anything else that they could do. Cheaper glasses. Huh. Cheaper, oh, oh, please, cheaper glasses. How did this, how did this come up? Um, was it... Storage prices creeping up and you're asking why are they creeping up and then peeling back the onion or so how, that's how actually work? that's a great question uh sorry i didn't interrupt was, mm -hmm. um, that was it. so this actually came up uh when we onboarded the customer when i took the customer over as a tam one of the things that i think all tams do is we kind of look and go where are you where are you spending money um and then i asked the uh, persistent disk was their largest spend it actually beat their cp it beat their actual vp vp yeah pardon me it beat their compute machine spend handily. Um, so that was just a driver of a question of, guys, this is not how I normally see this. What is going on here? Why are you doing this? And it turns out that they just have disks on disks on disks on disks and their backups. So uh, it was a driver more like, this thing is not the way it should be. Um, the issue is, and I think about this sometimes, that it makes me dry, ask more questions. If that would have looked normal on a graph when I looked at it, would I have addressed it as quickly? So I think sometimes it's just worthwhile asking the question of, hey, you, why are you doing this this way? Or what is going on here? Tell me about your stack, about why you use each part of it. Right. There's no guarantee. I mean, uh, th there's, there's probably other companies out there where storage isn't their top cost over compute, but maybe it's second or third, but it doesn't need to be second or third even can, mm -hmm. can drop down. But it's also like exactly as Eric said, you know, you ask the question why, and I've done that. I, I have one particular customer whose highest cost is, uh, GCS, Google Cloud Storage, which is unusual. Normally we see higher cost in compute and stuff like that. And I said to them why, and they explained why. There was a really good reason. Most of their work is actually, uh, they have devices and they do storage um, and they store a lot of cost customer data. And it's absolutely completely normal for them to have that. Um, but because it looked odd to me, I had to ask that question. You know, why, why is it look this way? And when they did explain their business, then I was like, okay, that's fine. Let's move on. We don't need to worry about it. Um, later on, Google came out with the intelligent tiering, um, and that made a huge difference to them, right? Because suddenly all that customer data that needs to be pulled up quickly can be stored in a much cheaper way. Um, so again, coming back to what Yeva was saying before, you need to keep on top of what the cloud features are, because as the cloud providers are releasing new things, you need to have a really quick look and, and maybe see if that's something that's, that works for you, if that's going to make a difference to your spend. Absolutely. Um, and sometimes we see technology as costing more, but there is an efficiency factor to it sometimes uh, when they release new features and things of that nature. Um, now I feel, are there any other stories? Because I think I gotta say, I use, I, this is a, an aside, but I use Lime scooters a lot in Tel Aviv. You can get anywhere really easily. And they have a feature where you can buy 60, 120 minutes ahead of time and it lasts for seven days or lasts for three days and it's much cheaper than paying on demand. And now I'm just going to think about this savings plan story every time I do that. I do it every time. We have the same ones here in, in, in Munich. And every time I'm like, because I don't ride them very often, but when I do, it's like in a big cluster. It'll be like over three days when I'm on a work yeah. trip, I'll do it every day. And so I always think when I'm going on that work trip, I should buy my reserved instances and do that up front. You said a cluster, and all I could think of was a group of you riding around on these scooters, actually. It was just like a group of you, just like music in the background, tootling down the road. I just want to know about those Lime scooter gangs. I don't have, I live in the U.S., so I don't have Lime scooter gangs. I have, a, I live near a college, and I have weird orange ones. I don't know what their name is, but they're orange, and there's just packs of college kids riding them around. Yeah, same, same, same but different, right? Yeah. It used to be here in, in Munich, it used to be the Segways. Um, they used to do tours on those big Segways. Those are real dangerous because people that get drunk and do them, the whole other story. People don't get drunk and do the scooters either. No, Just a bridge you can too lose far, your driver's I mean. license in Germany for that. Anyways, speaking of um, cost optimization, uh, any other any other stories before we sign off? Doesn't have to be as uh, 
as developed as maybe the ones you came prepared with, but before we sign off, it's also fine if, if not, because it's, it's okay to have a 25, 35 minute episode from time to time. No, absolutely. I mean, so I, I think the, the trouble with being a Tam is you come up, like you, you're doing this so often, you have to try and remember the big ones that, that stand out or the, the ones that are different. It's not really exciting if you say, yeah, we, we bought some savings plans and we saved some money, you know, like yeah. everyone does that all we the time. We went from GB2 to GB3. and Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had a similar one to Ian where a customer was getting close to the end of a commit and it was going to be cheaper for them to get off spot instances and use reserved instances instead um, because it meant they could do an upfront payment. But uh, I think it's really worth diving into that because Ian's already given the maths. Yeah, it sounds like the same the same yeah. week away there. Exactly. But uh, yeah. If that's it, thanks guys. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, for those listening, hope you have some takeaways there. Hope Hopefully Google makes some changes to their CUDs or Flex CUDs so that you can up front do what you could. Yeah, you could spend up front maybe to draw down um, or get closer to drawing down a commitment. Um, not have a true up or whatever they, whatever they call it. But uh, yeah, signing off. Thanks everyone. See you in the thanks next episode. Cool. Cheers. Bye, y'all. Thanks, everyone.